Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to mumble! Introducing first in the black corner in his trademark office suit jacket tie. With a record of over 8,000 tax returns and 1,000 vast statements lodged, standing 5'11 and weighing in at... <coughs> he is the man with the tax plan, the sultan of spreadsheets, the baron of vast statements, the king of ka -ching. Hailing from Ballarat, Victoria, Peter Angel! And in the white corner, sporting his struggling artist casuals, with a record of one and a half feature length films, one web series, and numerous award winning shorts, standing 5'10 and weighing in at. The Kubrick of Claptrap, the Mac Daddy of the MacGuffin, the Caesar of Subtext, the champion of all things indie, the arrogant know it all Israeli bastard, now hailing from Melbourne, Victoria, the unpronounceable. How do you say this? Itai Gumaman! Sit back and enjoy as they trade opinion jabs, fighting for their favourites and battling politely through the best and worst of, well, anything they see fit really. The accountant versus the filmmaker, the financial consultant versus the artist. What can possibly go wrong? Tune in and find out on the Best and Worst podcast, where it ain't all black and white. Hello and welcome to the Best and Worst podcast. My name is Peter Angel and I'm talking today to Ty Guberman about David Fincher films. How are you doing, Ty? Hey, Pete. Yeah, another interesting one we have here. I think so. It's a really, really hard one to rate. He's done some good stuff, hasn't he? He's done 11 films and they're all above average or well above average. And it's very, very difficult to rate or rank. I found my top three, they were set from the get-go. I knew what my top three favorite Fincher films were without even looking. The rest were, you know, they can move up and down a little bit. Yeah, well, I was sort of similar, except that for me, the bottom two, for me, were very obvious as far as my, you know, the way I like films and don't like them and all the rest of it. And my top two out of my top three or four films they were to me very obvious but the seven films left in the middle they all pretty much bounced around in the last day or two as i was trying to rate these because it was those middle ones that were all well, i think exceptional films it's very interesting he's he's a very good technician as far as as films go all his films are technically sound i can't i can't really pick at anything on, on a technical level no, and Aliens 3 was a little bit difficult because it was his first film. I think, from if memory serves me correctly, he was the third or fourth director to work on it. Yeah. And even when he'd finished, he had very little or no say over the way it was cut. So uh, I think he has gone and said that it is his worst film as far as he's concerned. But I think a lot of that may be the emotion of having so little control over a film that he wanted to be as good as the, the other couple of Alien films, I guess. Yeah, that kind of explains something, you know, with Alien 3, because Alien 3, you know, Alien franchise being a successful one, seeing his name as a first feature director was really odd, because before that he only made music videos, really. That's it. He's gone back to those in the middle and stuff, and I think that actually yeah. shows through his work, because he, I think we've spoken about this in the past, about some filmmakers are artists and some are perhaps a little bit more practical. And I think mm -hmm. because he has worked in making music videos where there's a lot of cash being thrown around and it probably still takes him a week or so to do a music video, he has worked in the commercial area that he has made some very good films, but they're also very commercially successful. Yeah, and they are a lot more you know, Hollywoody commercial, say, than artistic. You know, it's like it's a similar path maybe to, to like a Michel Gondry who, you know, made music videos and then went on to make films. But he made very, very artistic music videos and he went on to make artistic films. Yeah. With Fincher, it's a bit different. But when people ask me about top 10 directors, especially, you know, one still active, he, his name always comes up in the conversation because he has made some fantastic films. Yeah. The top two, the top three are really, really, you know, big favorites. So it's like, it's tough. 
He's got a really great eye, and he's, I think, a, a very good director with his actors as well. There aren't many bad performances in his films, if any. Yeah. But, but I, I feel on the whole, you know, the whole 11 of them, they lack a little bit of soul. There are films that are just, you know, they're straight stories. There's not a lot of subtext in there. It's interesting. I do like a lot of his films. They're very good. But he's not quite that artist. He is a, very much a, a, a technical filmmaker. So it all depends really on the script that he gets. Well, that's it. And also, as you say, it, well, you're talking about soul. And I guess when I hear that, I think commercial. If you look at the box office for all of his films, they've all made at least $85 million. So it's not like he's ever had one release that didn't, didn't have a lot of people looking at it. Yeah. And, and again, there's reason for that too. I mean, aside for him. And the reason would be all of his films, all of them, have fairly big stars in them. So you have fairly big draw get people in the in the cinema, say, yeah, or, or any other way to get viewers. And they all had, let's say, substantial budgets. Yes. So he did get something that not every filmmaker gets. Looking at, at his work is not the same as looking at, say, I don't know, like a Kevin Smith who made his first film with barely any money. It's a bit different. And I think that's also why it lacks soul, because... He always has the big budgets and the big names and his films are, for the most part, actually, I can't say that they're shiny because he definitely has this sort of dark kind of outlook and, and it actually even shows visually in some of his films. So he's an, he's an interesting one, <laughs> you know? I think that, you know, maybe outside of his top two or three, he can probably still make or will make better films than all the other ones um, in the future. I think he's a, he's a very good filmmaker. I think he needs maybe more inspiration. <laughs> it's, it's tough to, to quantify because, again, uh, he didn't really write many of, of these films, so no. scripts were not really by him. Many, if any, I'm not even sure. But I don't think so. I think his father wrote one. But I don't think that he's written any, no. Not a, he's not a writer, so it's really about taking somebody else's idea or vision and putting your own vision on top of that to make it visual. And generally, it's probably a more technical take than an artistic one. So, yeah, so, you know, we, we look at it for what it is, you know, a technical filmmaker and, and how much we've enjoyed his films. And I have to say, I've enjoyed pretty much all of them to an extent. Some more than others, but, yeah, all of them. I did too. Well, let's kick in with the IMDb and, and the budgets to, to see how um, how other people thought about them, not just us. No worries. All right. Well, with IMDb, the 11th highest ranking on IMDb was Alien 3, yep. and that was a 6.5. Yeah, which we probably could have guessed, but yeah. Yeah. And oh, look, I probably agree with that. I It might be my expectation because I'd seen the other couple of Aliens, obviously, before that. And for me, this was so much, I won't say worse, but so much not as good as the first Alien films. Possibly that's the way most people are ranking it. They're going in with disappointment in their mind, and that's why they probably end up being a 6.5. Yeah, I don't disagree with the 6.5 or even with the placing again. I think it's a good film. I think it could have been better. I think it has a lot of faults. The Ripley character, who's a favourite, mm was really good to see again, and she was good in it. And it had Charles Dance, who recently appeared in another one of his films. Yes. And Charles S. Dutton. It, it, just some, some very interesting characters, Ralph Brown. It was good. I, I liked it. I like those films that have one main character, maybe, and then a lot of other supporting characters that are all kind of interesting. And you, when you watch it, you're with the characters. So the journey in that one, for me, storytelling-wise, is probably better than most of his films. but as a film, it you know, technically, it's his worst film. Mm. But as far as being a favorite, you know, it, it also placed in my bottom three. But I don't think it's that bad. I think it's about, you know, maybe a 6.8, 6.9 out of 10, just under a 7. Yeah, you know, it's nothing like the first two films. Obviously, those were classics, fantastic films, more towards the, the 9 plus out of 10. So it's it's a fair difference. But I think it gets a bad, uh, bad rap. Mm. You know, it's a decent film. Well, you're talking 6.8. Well, that's IMDb, 6.8 for The Panic Room. So that's his 10th uh, lowest scoring as far as IMDb goes. Oh, well, also not far from mine. But yeah, that's pretty good. A decent film, an interesting story. It had some some actors to carry it, which all his films tend to. Yep. 
And it may have been, I don't know, when I talk to people, I feel that it's a little bit overrated. People seem to really love it. And I think it's pretty good. I'm more in agreement with the IMDb situation in this one. Jodie Foster was great. Kristen Stewart in sort of an early role. Yep. And Forrest Whitaker, who's a bit of a favorite of mine. So always good to see some heavy hitters there and um, you know it worked it's it's a decent film so you know a, a seven for me is a, is a very good film so yeah so at number nine we've got mank uh 7.1 on imdb now that's fairly recently out and often it does skew a little bit to the lower side with imdb when films are just out but still 7.1 is a very solid film yeah it's a good film i i heard many things about it before and i think it was maybe those raised expectations a little bit Yep. Um, but I think it's it's about fair where, where it's placed. And also black and white. A lot of people don't like that. So Yeah, no, I, I personally love black and white. You know, we'll talk about it later. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a decent film. No question. Yep. Then at number eight is The Social Network. So we're, we're now at 7.7. .7. So we're getting into the sort of scores that a lot of filmmakers never get. And this is his eighth highest ranking. Yeah, it's a big jump from 7.1, you know, to 7.7. .7. Yeah. The 7.7, .7, I think, is fair-ish. Uh, the ranking, I think, is low. Yeah, I think about right, but we'll get to that a bit later. And then at number <laughs> seven is Zodiac, also with a 7.7 .7 on IMDb. Mm, I think both low. Yeah, yeah. So both very, very solid films. And, well, 7.7 .7 is a really good score. Coming at number six is The Game, 7.8, from back in 1997. Yeah, I think it's about fair. The 7.8, yeah, 7.8 is about fair. Yeah, look, I do too. Speaking to people in the past, a lot of people didn't like it. So I'm a bit surprised it is that high. But yeah, I really like it. Yeah, I really like the game. I had an issue with it on first viewing. I thought it was a little bit predictable. Like I saw the twist coming miles and miles away. And then when I watched it again, I tried to put that aside and to actually you know, go along with the, with the story and all the rest of it. And it's a pretty solid film. I can't fault it because I picked it. They picked the, the yeah. twist. Yeah, and sometimes that happens and yeah. other people don't pick it or vice versa. You know, you pick, you yeah. don't pick it and someone does. And it's just a different experience, really, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, also at uh, 7.8 on IMDb is The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. That's his fifth highest scoring film. Yeah, that, that's very high for me. Maybe more so on the ranking than the actual rating. The 7.8 might be fair, although it's higher than what I would have rated it. But fifth on his list, nah, I think that's an exaggeration by miles. Yeah, Yeah. look, I agree. I think 7.8, technically, it is a really good film. It won a lot of awards and was nominated for a lot of awards and all the rest of it. But just sitting down and watching it, it's definitely not in his top five, is it? Yeah. No, I'll, I'll get I'll get into it uh, yeah. you know, very soon in a bit more detail. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Also, with 7.8 on IMDb, his fourth highest rating film is The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with, with, the, with the rating, with the 7.8. As far as the ranking of four, I think it's a bit high. Yeah, look, I do too. I think it's a bit high. Yeah, I probably wouldn't give it a 7.8. It's, it's not bad, but it's, yeah, I think a little high. Yeah. Then we get into the eights. We've got Gone Girl, his third highest ranked film on IMDb, with an 8.1. Yeah. Now, similarly to, to Dragon Tattoo, I think it ranked a bit high. The rating of, you know, roughly about eight is is roughly maybe a little bit high, but, but roughly right. It's also an interesting one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Then number two is seven, 8.6. This is a film from 1995 with a score of 8.6, which is huge. Yeah. I'm going to say a bit low. Wow. Big call. Yeah. I, th I think it's it's above a nine. It's a really, really great film, as as I see it. Yep. Going by the list, since we're at number two, I'm pretty sure <laughs> what num what com what's coming at number one, and I'd say yeah, those are two very, very, very strong films. They are number one, Fight Club, 8.8 .8 on IMDb. Which is about right, yeah. Yeah, also another film. For, well, that one's from 1999. So we're looking at 20-odd years old and, yeah, 8.8 .8 on IMDb. Funny that you mentioned that, that they're both like 95, 99, but they both hold up really well. Yeah. They, you know, watching them today still is good. So, yeah. What about the budgets? How did they do with their returns? That's that's more interesting, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yes. At least it's uh, it's not p opinions, is yeah. it? It's fact. So, yeah, well, Mank, that's the most recent one. That was made for Netflix. 
So it's a really hard one. Yeah, so I found the budget. The budget was about $25 million, But, uh, yeah, income-wise, there, there is no box office. Can't really do a return on investment for that one. The $25 million, I'd have to say, is about right. It's his lowest budget. Yeah. But, again, it's a Netflix film. So today I think deals are worked out completely differently to how they used to. Yeah. But being a Fincher film, he would be paid well for it as would Gary Oldman and, and a few of the others. There's an interesting setting, and again, it's a, it's a period film. So some of that would have, would have cost a little bit. Yep. You know, they, could have, they probably could have made it for a little bit less, but not a lot less. Yeah, $25 million, though. That is not a bad budget for that sort of film. Yeah, not bad at all. His highest budget is The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, $150 million. So, yeah. you know, six times the budget there. I'll get to the numbers on that one, but just... Lowest of twenty five million, highest of one hundred and fifty million. So there's a fair bit of a gap between those two. Yeah, but also you know, one was made in uh, twenty twenty, the other one is in two thousand and eight, and a lot happened in those twelve years. True, true. So yeah, but and and also you know the the nature of the films. You know, the uh, Benjamin Button was an epic kind of film. Yeah, it was long, and everything was tip top as far as technically. So they did probably throw quite a bit of money at that from the makeup department to sound to, to everything. And also in stretches, it's also somewhat of a period film. So yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah. So it would have cost, but 150 million is, yeah, I don't think any, any it's film should be made budget, that, isn't it? You know, outside of the, it, it's outside of the Marvel universe or outside of uh, James Cameron films, that's a huge budget. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think those should cost that much either. No. So his number 10 film was Zodiac, $65 million budget, only brought in $85 million at the box office, so 131% return on investment. Not surprising. It's over two and a half hours long. Yep. That usually kind of gets people to give it a miss, especially in the cinema. They go, well, if we go in now, what time do we, do we get out? It starts to become a calculation. Sure. And I think it would have lost a fair bit of audience there. Yeah. Also, the subject matter is not for everyone. You know, it's about a serial killer or pursuit of one. It's not a date movie, is it? <laughs> well, depends. For me, probably yes. <laughs> but yeah, two hours and thirty-seven minutes long. Yeah. Um, it's it's a toughie uh, for some people. Even now, on you know, watching it on Netflix. Yeah. But again, I have to say, it didn't feel that long to me when watching it. But some of the budget would have gone into all kinds of things. It's kind of a period film, you know, sort of 60s, 70s, 80s. Huge cast. Huge cast. And it's, it's a big film. The budget here, I would have to say, is justified. Yeah. The return, I don't think it is. I think they it should have, you know, made yeah. more money. Again, an interesting one because it's based on a book by uh, Robert Graysmith, who's one of the characters in it. But we'll, we'll talk about it more when we get to it in our, yeah. in our uh, countdowns. Yeah. Yeah. So the number nine film was Fight Club, $63 million budget. So similar to Zodiac, but made eight years earlier. Only brought in $101 million at the box office. So it was, you know, probably a little bit disappointing at the box office, but it was really on DVD and video and everything that it really took off, wasn't it? I would have to assume, because I don't actually remember, but that that had something to do with the rating. I remember it being fairly controversial at the time. Well, it's got full frontal male genitalia flashing on the screen and stuff. Uh, for, for a split second, and it's part of the story, but yeah. Yeah, but that would have put it into rated R. Yeah, so I think that may have hurt it back then, as far as cinematically. A little bit of violence as well. Oh, a lot of violence. It's a very violent <laughs> film. A very dark film. Two of the hottest male actors of that time. Three. You're forgetting Meatloaf. <laughs> yeah, Meatloaf. Man boobs himself. But he was actually very good in it. <laughs> he was. Yeah. But um, yeah, Brad Pitt and Ed Norton. Ed Norton at the time was, was huge. Brad Pitt, you know, still is. But also based on a Chuck uh, Palahniuk novel. Yep which was so, had sort of a, a big uh, cult following. Yep. A great film. But again, you know, we'll, we'll get back to it when we get there. And Yeah, disappointing return on investment, 160%. But it made a ton on yeah, DVD, probably even VHS almost at that time. Yep. It was still around, I think. Yeah. And even after, it probably got a Blu-ray release and streaming and all the rest of it, people still talk about this film, and deservedly so. Yep. And then at number eight is The Game. So a budget of $50 million. Box office of 109 million, so a return on investment of 218 percent. 
The 109 million is a little bit surprising. Yeah. I would have thought that it would have made more just on the sort of names. Yep. Name actors, especially again at that time. Michael Douglas at that time. Yep. Sean Penn. Well, Sean Penn at the time was, yep. was yeah, was a big one. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Mm. I would have thought it would have made more. It was a bit dark kind of film. Yeah. But yeah, no, I found it interesting. And again, this is one that also made some money. DVD and and yes, because again, this is 1997. I'm actually not sure why it made so little as far as box office at that sort of 97. People were rushing to see any Michael Douglas, mm. Sean Penn film, you know, that kind of thing. And even Fincher was building on the success of the of the earlier ones that did not necessarily succeed at the box office. At number seven, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. As we were talking about before, a budget of $150 million brought in $336 million at the box office. So a box office return on investment of 224%. And still a little bit low, you know, especially considering the awards talk surrounding it at the time. That's it. Nominated for 13 Oscars, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Supporting Actress. It only won three, and they were for um, art direction, makeup, and visual effects. But mm. the talk for a month or so around awards season was that this was a huge film. Yeah, but that kind of sealed it, I guess. When you're nominated for that many and you only win three, and they're all technical, people stop going to see it. I think justifiably so. Yeah, I think it's a hugely overrated film. It's it's good, but it's not great. Yeah, it's not what it could have been. Is it? I think it was written in like 1910, 1920 or something. That's when the original story was. Yeah, the story also, you know, for a lot of people, it was hard to kind of go along with. Mm. Yep. You know, it's a bit, bit, bit of a weird one, you know, a person who kind of ages backwards. Well... Also, a bit predictable when he was going to die, wasn't it, really? Yeah, you kind of knew what's coming. But again, even the story itself, it was a fairly long film, as I recall. Two hours, 46 minutes. Felt every minute. Yeah, a good hour and a half, maybe, of the middle of it Mm. was really boring. Mm. Like, nothing major happens there. It was like any other kind of romance story. Aside for the performances, some really good actors here, you know, doing their thing. Yep. In in Brad Pitt and Kate Blanchett, also Tilda Swinton. Mm. Good cast. Elias Cotillas, it's just, yeah, I just didn't get much out of it, I have to say. But it's a, it's an okay film. You know, it's still about a 7, I think, out of 10. Yeah, well, this road's 7.8, so probably a little high. I mean, another one that we probably both think is a bit overrated is the next film, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Mm-hmm. It's his sixth highest return on investment. Budget of $90 million, uh, Box office, $233 million, with a return on investment of 259%. So, good film, but... Well, possibly not as good as the original. Yeah, it did well um, in the cinema. I think they they always knew it was gonna uh, was gonna do well because the film, the Swedish version, was uh, sort of had a bit of a cult following and a bit of a sort of that cult success. And they knew that as soon as they make an American version, everybody would go to see it. Yeah. No, it's not as good as the Swedish version, and it's not as good as the book. Yeah. And it just, to me, felt pointless. Because, you know, you got Daniel Craig and Rooney Mara, and you just kind of go, you know what? The original actors did better in these roles. They were more more suitable. I just did not understand why the need to change it just so people don't have to read subtitles. That always kind of pisses exactly. me off. Exactly. I was going to say, that is why. Yeah. People are lazy, and they won't read subtitles. Yeah. And again, yeah. you know, it's it's almost like a movie made for stupid people, in a way. You know? It's like, mm. if you if you can't read, you need this. And I just think, I don't know, I never like dumbing down of anything. Yeah. But the budget is massive for that kind of film. It did not need to cost that much. No, because it could have been done for $9 million, really, when you look at the sets and things. Yeah, I, I refused to, to go see it in the cinema, sort of on, mm. a, on, on that basis. I did catch it, I think, on DVD. And again, you know, I, I was never going to miss out on a film that has Daniel Craig and Rooney Mara and Christopher Plummer, R.I.P., and uh, Stellan Skarsgård and, and Stephen Perkoff and Robin Wright. It was just such a s- sort of massive film as far as actors and stuff. Yeah. But $90 million, I don't know, for a remake yeah. of a film that's based on a book, I don't know. I thought it was just a kind of a pointless thing that was out there. And again, quality-wise, when you look at the film – technically sound it's a very very good film it's very close to being potentially you know eight out of ten but how can you separate it from the fact you know that it's a a remake yeah 
and and an unnecessary one at that. <laughs> That's right. So yeah, disappointing. And well, yeah. Speaking of disappointing, the number five film, Alien Three. Ooh. Budget of fifty million, brought in one hundred and sixty million, nice. so it did all right at the box office, three hundred and twenty percent. But yeah, I was look, I was disappointed with it. But based on the numbers, you would take that nearly every time. Yeah, there was no way that that it was not going to make money because again, it's yeah. part of the franchise. After the success of the first two, people were waiting to see it. So I'm not surprised. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Number four, Panic Room. So we've got a budget of forty eight million and box office of one hundred and ninety seven million, four hundred and ten percent return. Very good numbers for a film like Panic Room, which not a bad film, but really it's it doesn't bring too much original to the table, does it? You know, there's something interesting about about the film. You know, that that whole Panic Room. You know, basing it on on that as a story, but then when you watch it, it was a little bit of like a thriller by the numbers. Mm. The way the middle was good, but the ending was a bit me. You know, a bit sort of yep. by the numbers again. But great actors. I'm glad that the budget was not over fifty million because that would have been exaggerated. Yeah, I think they should have made it for about maybe thirty, thirty-five. I don't have many complaints about this one. It's uh, I'm glad it did well again because of the names involved and all the rest of it. I wouldn't have wanted it to fail. It's a decent film, you know, seven and a half probably roughly. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yes, so The Social Network, $40 million budget, $225 million at box office, so a return on investment of 563%. Yeah, possibly it was nominated for eight, eight different Oscars, so possibly that had something to do with the box office. For sure, yeah. The Oscar talk always gets um, people in, in the cinemas to see it, especially when films were still sh uh, showing in cinemas. This one had a few things going for it, you know, with, with the younger uh, popular cast. And also the soundtrack by um, Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails. I think a few people were curious about that, and it was a very good soundtrack. Yeah. Again, it was very topical at the time as well, you know, the whole Zuckerberg situation, Facebook. There was no way that it was not going to make a profit on a $40 million budget. Yeah. It was it was always going to do well. At that, at that time, in 2010, $40 million budget was a real sort of mid-range budget. Within a few years, those budgets almost disappeared. There were no more films made for that kind of money. It was either, you know, low or really high. So that was that was really interesting. It did well, and I, I think deservedly so. Yeah. So that's uh, that's number three on that list? Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's number three. And number two is Gone Girl, a budget of $61 million and a box office of $369 million. So a return on investment of just over 600%. Wow. Yeah, almost, you know, kind of fair enough. Because, again, it was 2014. Fincher was established... This one also may have been nominated for some awards. It was written by Gillian Flynn. Yep. She wrote the novel and the screenplay. And again, you know, just a, just a fantastic cast and all all kind of at the, at their peak, you know, from Ben Affleck to uh, even Neil Patrick Harris, Tyler Perry doing a bit of a straight role. Yeah, it was really good. Rosamund Pike. Yeah. A solid solid thriller that was probably in some way riding the success of a of a very, you know, like a best-selling novel. So yeah. Yeah. Not surprising. No, that's right. And then number one, seven. Thirty three million dollar budget, brought in three hundred and twenty seven million at the box office. Hmm. The the surprising thing is I'm not hearing any huge money maker out of these. You know, they're all in the three hundred and something. Yep. Not even going under three hundred and fifty million in there, I don't think. What's the highest uh yeah, Gone Girl, 369 million, and then Benjamin Button, 336 million, and then Seven, 327 million. Yeah. So only one film of his uh, cracked the 350, you know, and that was at a time when, you know, over that span, a lot of films were not even talking about, you know, the, the big ones that were getting over a billion dollars, but there were a lot of decent films cracking the 500 million mark. So did well, but not great. So like, like really good, solid, yeah. you know. Solid yeah. numbers. And, uh, and I'm very, very happy with Seven that, it, that it's done as well as it did. Because, again, good film. What was the budget again? $33 million. Yeah, that's pr pretty low, but, but it did have that look. It looked a bit more sort of gritty. That's gritty, yeah, with, with, with the T. And it had a bit of, of an indie slightly feel to it, you know? It did. And it was his second film, so probably was under a bit of pressure to keep the budget down a bit. Yeah, and by far his darkest film. Not just visually, also, you know, in the message and the story and everything. And to me, the the probably the best cast out of all his films as far as how solid they all were. Yeah, great film. But again, we'll talk about it 
on our list soon, soon enough. Very hard to put these in any sort yeah. of order at all, really. For me, my least favourite was Alien 3. That was one of the two that I found very easy to put towards the bottom. Not a terrible film. Perhaps my expectations were too high. But, yeah, I think his worst film. Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know if I think it was his worst film, but it's definitely one of his worst, but still good. You know, which we talked about before, you know, and I mentioned all that great cast and that story and, you know, the Ripley character. It had a lot going for it, but it did fail on uh, many, many technical accounts. Um, the alien wasn't as prominent in it and looked terrible in certain scenes, especially when it was like sort of on the ceiling and, and, and running around. It just looked so computerized and so bad. But the story-wise and just sitting there and being entertained, it didn't do too badly. I think it's close to a 7 out of 10. And yeah, on my list, it's 10th, not 11th. I, I, I still rate it low, yep. but, but not as low as everybody seems to, to rate it. Yeah. My 11th is, I think it's probably a better film than Alien, technically. I just didn't like it as much. I just didn't connect with it. I found it to be okay. It's about a 7 out of 10 if you look at the technical aspects and everything else. But I am not a big fan of films like that. And that is The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. I felt it was very Spielbergy, I would have to say. Yeah. Where it's all, there's a lot of dumbing down. You know, the music tells you how to feel and when. Everything about it sort of guides you and, and tries to force some kind of uh, feeling out of you. It just felt a bit manufactured. The performances were very good, and that's kind of what kept me in it. But again, very long, very grandiose when it didn't really need to be, which is sort of, you know, why the budget's so high and... Like I said, it didn't need to be so high. No, look, I rated that nine. So I guess for me, when I was making my list and I was looking at that and I thought it should be in the middle somewhere and it just kept going further and further down list because, yeah, it just doesn't, it's not that good a film. It's technically very good, but I doubt that I'll ever watch it again. It's not the sort of film that you want to go back to. Yeah, because for lack of a better word... It's a little bit boring. Mm. And that's really what, what it was about. The entertainment factor just wasn't there for me. It just felt like it was trying to tell me, look how good this is. Look how sad this is. Look how beautiful this is. You should cry here, you know? And I'm like, I, I don't want to be told. <laughs> I want to experience it. So for me, it, it's 11th. Yep. And Alien 3 is 10th. Yeah, well, my number 10 is The Panic Room. Well, that's my number nine. So we, we have this exact same bottom three. The Panic Room, again, was a bit disappointing. It's not a bad film, as you were saying before. Jodie Foster's very good in everything that she does. It just, again, probably not another movie I'd go back to. Some of the ones I put towards the top, I'll watch again and again. But Panic Room, I doubt I'll ever see it again. It's funny because as you're talking about it, I'm thinking perhaps I should watch it again <laughs> just <laughs> to kind of make sure that I remember it to be on certain levels as cliche maybe as as i remember it it was just like especially towards the ending i think it was just like any other thriller it was that's where it was disappointing it had a nice build up great performances kristen stewart very young sort of early role she was really good and you know jared leto before he became bigger and bigger like you said jodie foster great cast technically good the story was a bit iffy yeah so, yeah, good film, but I still rank it, you know, about a 7 out of 10, and it's uh, outside my top 8. My number 8, maybe surprisingly, maybe not, but was Mank. Yep, well, probably, I think, a little low. I rated it at 6, so I guess we're not too far off, really. Yeah, I had it at, you know, close to about a 7.5 out of 10. Technically sound, looks great. I, I love a good black and white. The performances were really good. I especially enjoyed Charles Dance in it. Again, he was in Alien 3 as well. And a solid film of a story that I felt deserved to be told and was interesting to watch. Even seeing the portrayal of Orson Welles yes. was really interesting. Yep. Didn't quite portray him favorably, let's say, or maybe on some counts, but not on other. Yeah, I expected a little bit more of Orson Welles going into it. It's, I know it's called Manx, so it's, it's about Herman Mankiewicz, but I still expected mm. a little bit more of Orson Welles in it. Yeah, because the ending kind of tried to put it to you as far as this is a thing between Mank and, and Wells, you know, about credit and about who deserves more credit for this film and all the rest of it. Mm. And although this film tried to push it in that way, 
There is no doubt in my mind that Orson Welles deserves most of the credit for Citizen Kane. Yeah. I mean, you know, Mank wrote a great script, but he's still the writer. Yeah. The one who put it all together was Welles. There's just no question. Yeah. But it was more about Mank versus sort of Hearst. Yeah. Well, it was Mank against everybody, really, wasn't it? He was just seemed to be trying to pick fights with everybody. Yeah, and, and I felt the fragmented sort of structure of the film where it goes back and forth and flashback and this and that, and they tried to kind of justify it with a scripting thing as far as now, they, they actually told you this was a flashback, you know, before you see it, mm. kind of like uh, in, in a script. I thought that hurt the film, that structure. I think it would have been told better if they didn't go back and forth so much yeah, because it kind of loses impact. They show you Mank as a negative character, and then quickly bring it back to almost present time of the story to show, you know, he's a good guy. He's just kind of misunderstood and, and he's sick. He's an alcoholic, you know, but he's an artist. He's brilliant. He's this and it's that. And it's like, yeah, I, I get it. The guy was brilliant, but he was probably also an asshole. Definitely. He definitely was. Yeah. Also, you know, it was relatively easy to work out when it was back and when it was forward and all the rest of it. But, yeah. It sort of took you out of it a little bit because you're trying to think, now, when was this again? Because yeah. it's the same actor. He looks very similar. I agree. And and just, just him, you know, writing the script, the way he wrote it, criticizing someone who was essentially good to him. Oh, he's benefactor, wasn't he? Yeah. Was even more treacherous. It was just really a huge betrayal. And you can't help but be on the side of Hearst. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. We felt, oh, I felt sorry for him, for Hearst, because... He's paying the, half the guy's wage. Yeah, it wasn't just that. He liked him. You know, he liked Mank. He gave him a, a seat at, at his table right next to him because, you know, they say he didn't like his writing as much as he liked to hear him talk. I thought that was an interesting kind of quote. Yeah. So our so-called hero is actually kind of the bad guy. And then in the end, they try to make him look like he was a hero, like he, he got... Mm. The, the credit that he deserved as writer. Sure, he deserved that credit, but he signed that credit away, and you don't go back on that. If you signed it, you signed it. Yeah. You can't all of a sudden, yeah. after finishing the script, go, no, it's that good, so so I, I want credit. As if It's as if to say, if the script I wrote was crap, then I would be fine with, with you keeping the credit. And, and that's just... That's right. So I could yeah. definitely understand why Wells kind of cracked it and why things went the way they went. But yeah, it wasn't just Mank versus Hearst. He was also very much versus uh, Mayer of, you know, Metro Goldwyn Mayer fame. Yeah, that's true. And what did you think of the acting performances? Like, there's a lot of talk about awards. I don't know about awards, I have to say, for, for this film. I think that Gary Oldman was very good, but I don't know if I would give him an Academy Award for this performance. Yep. Again, depends on who he's up against. I thought Amanda Seyfried was, was very good, very likable. and She was good, but I don't think any better than anything else she's been in. And yet people are raving about her performance. Because there was something about the subtlety of a character who's perhaps a little bit simple, but she's aware of it. Mm. And that's an interesting character. And she did well with that. I thought the most interesting character acting-wise was Tuppence Middleton playing poor Sarah, his wife. Long, yeah, long-suffering wife. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she was very good, and it came across, you know, you felt for her and you liked her. Yeah. Of course, they gave her sort of an ending where she's kind of almost putting her foot down to show some strength, but I think she showed it all the way through. She was just trying to, in a way, support his genius because she knew what he had in him. Yeah. Very similarly to, uh, I think it was, was that Lily Collins who played his assistant? Uh, yes. Yeah, she was yeah. also very good. Yeah. So, yeah, just a lot of strong women around him, even Amanda Seyfried in a way. Mm. But, yeah, my favorite was Charles Dance. Uh, if he gets nominated for a supporting actor, I, I wouldn't argue that. Yeah. But solid film. And so that was your eight and my six. So my eight was The Social Network. Yeah, I think that's very low. But, you know, what would you kind of rate it out of 10? Probably, yeah, probably seven and a half. Yeah. So that's, you know, it's like, I would say it's more of an eight. And again, it's like half a, half a point, which seems far, but not that far, you know. It was higher on my list. It was, uh, I can give it away. It was my number four. Yeah. 
But as we've said, all those middle films, there's not much between them, is there, really? Not much. They they could go in, in any order and you kind of go, yeah, I can see it. I, I don't yeah. necessarily agree with it as far as my list, but I can see it. Yeah, and my score may be a little low because I'm a little bit down on Facebook and how they're trying to take over the world at the moment. I'm very much down on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, which shouldn't have much to do with a film about them. Yeah. But that may have pushed it down. Who knows? No, I remember that when it came out, there was a lot of talk, a lot of awards talk about it as well. Mm. And even some of the award talk was to do with Jesse Eisenberg. And I thought, you know what? He was good, not great. It's not yeah. like he was Jesse Eisenberg, which he tends to be in a lot of his films. He's not very different. Yeah. The one that stood out for me for this film is Justin Timberlake. I thought he was very good. And it kind of surprised me as to, you know, how good of an actor he can actually be. Yeah. And again, Rooney Mara, always solid. Yeah. Andrew Garfield's not one of my favorites, but he was pretty good. So yeah, you know, performances wise, it's a good film. Technically a very good film, fantastic soundtrack. And I did like the story and the way it unfolded and everything. So I, I do enjoy it. So again, you know, fourth on my list. Yeah. So, well, what was your number seven then? My number seven was one of two films that I really struggled with. But this is where it ended up, and that's The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Oh, snap. Me too. I got that a seven as well. A very, very solid film, but its reason for existing is lost on me. I mean, I can understand that. I just disagree with it. You know, that people need to see a film in English. The Hollywood version, I don't see why, because the Swedish version is far superior, I think. It's a fantastic thriller. And when you take something that is already good, like really good, and then you, it's the same story, and you remake it, and it's the same. It's never as good mm. as, as the original. Yeah. It's that simple. Great performances, solid film. I have to say that after seeing Numi Rapus in the Swedish version mm. as Lisbeth Salander, I thought Rooney Mara would suck, <laughs> but she didn't. Mm. You know, she was very good, um, but not as good. Yeah, she was. And look, from memory, I don't even remember the original being overly dialogue heavy. So I don't know why people couldn't read the original film when it, that much dialogue in it, was there? I didn't notice, I have to say. I, it didn't take that into, into account much. I remember that Elizabeth didn't talk all that much for a stretch. Mm. And then she kind of did. I look at the list of actors from the remake and it's just mind-boggling, you know, Daniel Craig, Rooney Mara, Christopher Plummer, Stellan Skarsgård, Stephen Burkhoff, Robin Wright, Jolly Richardson. Great, great cast. Yep. Still not as good as the original. Yeah. So, you know, solid film. Still, to remake something, not quite exactly, but almost, and still have it at, you know, above eight, is still really good, but I have to take points away from it for being almost not an exact replica, but yeah. obviously it's going to lack originality. Yeah, that's right. And numbers-wise, as we discussed before, it did okay. It's just yeah. that I guess that's why we both ranked it, you know, somewhere in the middle. It's okay. It's, it's a film made strictly for the money, nothing else, which is fine. I understand the need for that. And he did well in the cinema and all the rest of it because people were obviously waiting to see it. And these are people who did not go, you know, to see the Swedish one. Such is the world. My sixth was Manx. So what was your sixth? My sixth, Gone Girl. Ah, my fifth. So not too far off there, actually. Yeah. Again, it's, it's a really solid film. I am not at all disagreeing with the 8.1 that it got on IMDb. Mm. It's very close to that. It's probably not as good as the book. But then again, most films are not as good as the book. Yeah. The novel by uh, Gillian Flynn, Gillian Flynn, was, was a very good one. Like, I, I read it before seeing the film, and when watching the film, it just took me back to the book. And I, I, every time, you know, I thought, oh, this wasn't as good as the book. This wasn't as good as the book. Well, it was still good. If I wouldn't have read the book before, I probably would have liked the film a little bit more. Yeah. So, you know, it goes to show. Really good. And acting-wise, it potentially is Ben Affleck's best film. Yeah, he was very good, and Rosamund Pike nominated for an Oscar for Best Actress, so, you know, she yeah. was very good. And, again, you know, Neil Patrick Harris and Tyler Perry. Kim Dickens is a bit of a favourite of mine, and Patrick Fugit. A lot of good actors in it. It's sort of right where it should be, you know. It's above an eight, had great source material, because not only is it based on the book, but Flynn also wrote the script. Yeah. He had a lot to work with, and I think he did a really, really good job. 
it's maybe even a little low on my list. But again, because I like the book a fair amount better than I did the film. It's not a lot, but it's still something. It made me drop it down a bit. It's one that might creep up the list a little bit, you know, as time goes by. So what's your number five? My number five is the game. My number four. I feel like I'm a little bit ahead of you here. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. But yeah, no, the game, again, you know, a solid film, about an 8 out of 10. As I said before, it's one that I saw in the cinema. I remember picking the ending fairly early on. I knew what I was watching, and I was just watching to see if I got it right. So the whole time, the first viewing, I was there just waiting in anticipation to see if the film's going to surprise me or not. So I think that kind of makes you follow the film a little bit less. Yep. Upon rewatch a few years later, I liked it a bit more. You know, I wasn't really looking at the twist as as that important. You know, obviously, you've seen it before. You already know it's coming from the beginning, so it doesn't really matter. So you just watch it for that. And I watched it for technical aspects, uh, acting, direction, a, lo- a, lo- a lot of things. And it's it's a solid, solid film. Yeah, I didn't pick it and I didn't watch it for any of that stuff. I just watched it for enjoyment. Really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is a fun ride, isn't it? Yeah. And it's funny because, you know, it's got uh, Michael Douglas and, uh, well, Sean Penn is actually kind of a smallish role, I have to say. You know, he kind of comes into it and then he disappears. Playing his brother that's sort of pulling the strings. But for the majority of the film, I don't think we see him, if I remember correctly. But again, I I don't think he was, uh, uh, should have been like second billing. I think Deborah Kara Unger was really the second character and she was very good, you know, to me possibly the best. Sean Penn, always, I think, a good actor, or at least most of the time. Michael Douglas is, you know, I I didn't like him, you know, earlier on in his career, but yeah, he is solid. But yeah, it had a a few interesting sort of character actors. James Reborn and Peter Donay and uh, Armin Mueller-Style was a bit of a favorite. I really did did enjoy it more on second viewing, but you know, generally it's the other way around. You kind of enjoy films less and less, I guess. And that kind of bumped it to, to five for me. Yeah. And as you say, with Michael Douglas, very good in this. This was before he started to look like everybody's grandmother. You know, back in the day when he looked like himself. <laughs> it become sort of more interesting and more entertaining for me as as time, yep. you know, went by. Initially, when he came out as a, as a younger actor, I didn't rate him very highly. I was a massive fan of his father. So I just didn't think he had the same charisma. Kirk had more of a more of a grasp, I think, on the whole acting thing and who he was and what he was doing. And to me, I could I could see some uncertainty, yeah, and some arrogance in Michael Douglas when he was younger. Yeah, I always used to confuse his father with Burt Lancaster. <laughs> well, both solid actors, both are you know in in my massive favorites of mine. We're the same last three. Yeah, the same top three, and let's find out about the order. Right, well, what's your three? My number three is, and again, I think it's very, very close. I think being a later film sort of dropped it down maybe a little bit, but it's uh, Zodiac. My number two. Great film, isn't it? It is. I watched it in the last couple of days and very long film. Yeah. And probably, I don't know, half an hour in, I was thinking, oh, boy, this this is actually a little bit of work. And then it just got better and better and better, and it just really sucks you in. And I'm watching it thinking, that. They don't catch the guy, do they? Look, it's pretty obvious who it is, and they're going to catch him, and they don't. But it doesn't actually distract anything from the film. No, it doesn't. And that's that's the thing. You're following it just for the story. And even though the ending is almost anticlimactic, you kind of go, oh, my God, this is such a solid film. I want to see more. Yeah. And it's crazy, you know, watching a film that is like over two and a half hours, and you want to see more, <laughs> you know, that's just yeah, huge. And that, to me, in a way, is uh, potentially one of the best, or if not the best, uh, Fincher film as far as the storytelling aspect. Yeah. The way this film is cut, you know, the editing and everything is just brilliant. You don't feel the two and a half hours go by. The characters are really, really interesting. Jake Gyllenhaal, always great. Something something about this one, you know, I, I, I wouldn't even rate it necessarily as his best performance because he's made so many good films, but it is really good. <laughs> and it's not, you know, just him. I mean, the top three guys in it are three of my top 10 living actors today. Yeah. You know, Robert Downey Jr. and uh, Mark Ruffalo. Yeah. 
And it's just, yeah, just really, it's that great. I don't, I don't even, it's hard to even point at exactly what it is. I know. And then, well, you throw in Brian Cox, you throw in Anthony Edwards, Chloe Savini, and then you've got John Carroll Lynch as the guy that's probably Zodiac. John Carroll Lynch is fantastic in this. Yep. He was almost like mesmerizing to watch. That scene that they bring him in for questioning is just so good mm. because it's like he is daring them to catch him yeah. while kind of knowing that it's all circumstantial, that they won't be able to do much with it. Mm. You know, he sits there in a conversation, fiddling with his watch, almost showing them the watch. He was like almost pointing at it yeah. until, you know, Mark Ruffalo notices and asks to have a look at it. And it's a Zodiac watch. Yeah. <laughs> so... And then it's, he goes and says, "Oh, it's probably about the knife with the blood on it. I, yeah, I'd just been killing a chicken. It's probably yeah. you probably asked me about this, and it's like, no, they didn't even know any of that stuff. So he's giving them extra information, and they still can't do anything with it. And it just makes it that much more interesting, you know. Like some of them are saying, no, it's not him, it's him, it's not him. But yeah, worth mentioning. Also, um, we we recently uh, talked about the Coen Brothers film Blood Simple, you mm. and I, and John Getz, who's in the lead role in that one, actually appears in this film." Yeah. After a long time. Yeah. There's a lot of interesting in this movie. <laughs> yeah. The way it's told, you know, some of it is almost bordering on, on a documentary-ish kind of look. And the performances. It, it could have easily been number one. I know that a lot of people do rate it as number one for Fincher films. Mm. But I, I kind of disagree. I mean, obviously, it's my number three. But also, I think, you know, it deserves as much praise as, as it can get. Yeah, and for me, there's not much between these top mm. three. So it could have gone anywhere. So Zodiac for you was three, for me two. Oh, yeah, my number three. What's your number three? Yes, yeah, so my number three is seven. Mm-hmm. Mm. So obviously not your number two. So I think we can guess there. So well, hang num- on. Yes. We have, I haven't said what my number two is. <laughs> well, you would have told me that this was your number two <laughs> because we know what your number three is. Yeah, so seven. For me, number three. Is my number one, yes. Uh, Fight Club is my number two, which is your number one, obviously. Yes, that's right. And again, nothing between any of them. I put seven at number three because I guess, you know, rewatching it, the start was a little on the slowish side maybe for me, but that was the only negative I could find with it. It is a fantastic film. It really holds up. 20, 25, 26 years old, mm-hmm. still holds up so well. And, look, any film that you don't see it, but any film that implies that Gwyneth Paltrow's head is in a box is a good film. I have to say, it's it's a funny thing with Fight Club. I do have a problem with Fight Club, but even though I have a problem with it, it still rates as number two on this list. So what's your problem? Is it because nobody's talking about Fight Club, but everybody knows about it? I don't understand. My 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 problem with it is the, the twist. Hmm. The, the twist that is actually almost a little bit, you know, Deus Ex Machina. It's a little bit the hand of the writer coming in and, and basically the end kind of changing things around. Yep. Even though if you go back, you can follow it and see that, yes, they never really are at the same place at the same time. Yep. They do give you a lot of the film in kind of a, P, a POV, you know, kind of the point of view of the Edward Norton character, yep. leaving you to think... Of course, the other person is there, you know, mm. and I, and I think that's a little bit cheating. Are you annoyed because you didn't pick the twist? <laughs> I kind of I picked I picked it as a possibility, but I kept saying I don't think they would do that because again of the way they showed it all along. I thought it's a little bit less clever. It's more cheating. They could have done this in a better way, I think. And again, it's not that I don't like the twist. I just don't like the way they did it. Because some information that you get through a film, you, you're kind of supposed to take with you going forward as a solid. And in this case, they may just think a certain thing and then it's like, no, it's not. It's actually this. But they didn't quite show it. Other films do it cleverly where they show it to you. It's yeah. right in front of you, but you can't see it. Yeah. And in this case, they didn't show you. So showing Brad Pitt and Edward Norton having a full-on fist fight and then later showing you that there were actually like CCTV ca- cameras there mm. and Ed Norton is actually beating the shit out of himself. That doesn't stand for me. They should have shown that in a, in a more clever way because the way the fight was shown to us with two people punching each other was not the same as one person punching himself on camera. Mm. 
So which one is it? And to me, that's a little bit poor. But again, the rest of it is just so good that it's hard to pick at it too much. But for me, that's what drops this film maybe down below a 9 out of 10. Yeah. Just, which is really where, um, you know, IMDb has it at 8.8. But 7, on the other hand, for me, Mm. is above a 9 out of 10. It is that good. So much of it is, it's not exactly subtext, but it's still very, very interesting about what it's saying about the characters and the relationship between, you know, Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman's characters. The funny thing is, you know, when when you talk to people about um, Seven and, you know, who the Mm. hero is and all the rest of it, everybody says Brad Pitt. I say, no, it's not. It's Morgan Freeman. It's his film. It's the it's the character he tells you. It's yeah. his point of view. Everything about it is is him about how he's trying to to do yeah. the best he can while knowing it really won't make that much of a difference. <laughs> it's like a really bleak film. Morgan Freeman always fantastic. Brad Pitt was really good in it. Even Gwyneth Paltrow, who I'm not a major fan of, was was interesting. But Kevin Spacey, oh my god. I understand it's not politically correct these days to, you know, to say anything good about him, but he is the best thing about this movie. And he is only there for a fairly short time. Oh, he plays a bastard really well, doesn't he? Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Mm. Forget a bastard. He plays a psychotic serial killer, a highly intelligent one, so well, just so well. It is one of my all-time favorite films. So, you know, that's why I kind of had to push it to number one past, you know, Fight Club and Zodiac. But I do appreciate all three films, and I think they're fantastic. But I I do think that Seven kind of separates itself from the others. Yeah, and that's the way I feel about Fight Club. And But really, having said that, there is so little between those top three. It's incredible, really, isn't it? Yeah, these three films are the reason that Fincher is considered by many, and and even by me, as one of the the best, you know, still working today. Yeah. It had a a couple of character actors also in Seven popping in there, but they're fairly kind of smallish roles. You know, Arlie Hermé is in it, and uh, Reggie Cathy, who was also with Kevin Spacey in House of Cards. Yep. Very, 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 very good film. Again, it's one that I spoofed in my series and and film, in my comedy, The Bruce Springsteen's. Yep. It's actually, yeah, not, not so much in the series, but in the movie. But by far, it's probably the most iconic scene in any Fincher film, you know, What's in the Box. Mm. It just keeps coming up in, in almost everything. Yeah, true. But such a dark, dark film and just so, so good. Yeah. All right, well, we better run through our uh, top 11. Top 11. We better run through our 11 film. But for me, at number 11 was Alien 3. Then at number 10, Panic Room. Number 9, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Number 8, The Social Network. Number 7, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Number six, Mank, which I don't think I mentioned his father actually wrote the screenplay for. Number five, Gone Girl. Number four, The Game. Number three, Seven. Number two, Zodiac. And my number one film, Fight Club. My least favorite is The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Number 10, Alien 3. Number nine, Panic Room. Number eight, Mank. Number seven, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Number six, Gone Girl. Number five, The Game. Number four, The Social Network. And my top three that I think are, you know, separated from the rest quality-wise by a fair bit. Number three, Zodiac. Number two, Fight Club. And number one, Seven. Excellent. Very good list of films, though, isn't it? So it's funny, but, you know, another week, another episode. And again, my list is correct and yours is wrong. I just don't understand. What are the chances? (laughs) Happens every week. (laughs) It's a miracle. (laughs) It is. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Well, thanks very much uh, for that, Ty, and I'll talk to you again next week. Thanks for listening to the Best and Worst Podcast. We'd like to thank everyone who joined and listened to the show. We appreciate you all and hope you'll keep coming back for following episodes. A big thank you goes out to Tam Hinges for helping us out tremendously and voicing our intro, and Scott Martin for working his magic on the intro sound edit. Also, a big thank you goes out to Asaf Angel for all the help with the logo design. Great work, everyone. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you. If you like the show, then please recommend the podcast to your family and friends and subscribe, share, follow, leave a comment. You know the drill. For more information, please check out the show notes. Thanks for listening. We'll be back again next week.